Hello and welcome to The Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. My name's Kenny <coughs> McBride and I'm joined today by two excellent guests. Firstly, by Dr. Philippa Whitford, MP. Philippa, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thanks very much. Excellent. And on the other side of me, we have journalist Simon Pia. Simon, how are you doing? Good, good. Another Hibs win, Kenny. <laughs> so good mood. That's all you need, isn't it? Right, so we start today, as we always do, with our coronavirus statistics update. Uh, so this is as of 2 p.m. yesterday. Uh, obviously, today's uh, numbers will be published a couple of hours from now. Uh, but yesterday, there were 221 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Scotland, uh, but once again, a day with no new reported deaths. Uh, so a total of 676,477 people in Scotland have now been tested. Of those, 654,042 were confirmed negative, 22,435 tests were positive. Uh, there were 261 people in hospital, uh, this would have been Friday night, eight of whom were in intensive care, and the, the number of people who have tested positive and subsequently died now stands at 2,400 Sorry, 2,499. So that's where we are with uh, the coronavirus numbers just now. Uh, but our top story today is uh, an, a story that Boris Johnson is allegedly looking to break human rights law. He wants to withdraw the UK from the ECHR uh, or alter the, the Human Rights Act here in the UK. Uh, now, I'll come to you first on this, Philippa. This was something that Theresa May talked about at some length Um the, the problem of not being able to deport criminals, not being able to get rid of the people that we want to get rid of. Um, what do you make of this, this kind of story coming out that Boris Johnson is now seriously considering the same thing? Well, it's clear the Conservatives have had their eye on human rights law and the European Convention of Human Rights for quite some time. They've used Brexit to kind of muddle it up as if, as if somehow this is related to Brexit or related to the EU. But of course, the Convention on Human Rights predates the EU by you know, quite some decades and came out of the, the Second World War. I mean, you know, Boris Johnson's big hero, Churchill, was involved in moving towards having this kind of protection. And the simple aspect where it does affect Brexit is one of the good things, one of the many good things that we had from the EU were things like the European arrest warrants, the sharing of data and information around terrorism, around policing. And, you know, if, if a policeman arrested someone for something minor, they could check immediately if they were wanted in any other European country perhaps for you know a violent crime or abuse etc and they would know that straight away if we're excluded from this then what you're talking about is you have to go away and check and ask for information it can take ages you have to go through extradition so one of the things the uk wants to keep are some of these security and policing benefits but the eu will not countenance that if the uk becomes a country that is outside the protection of human rights law because they simply will not allow that their citizens could be arrested or extradited to a country that doesn't uphold these principles and it's a bit like international law if you want to break it when it suits you it won't be there to protect you when you need it mm -hmm. And Simon, um, this kind of constant drumbeat of the last few years that human rights law was somehow interfering with British sovereignty, um, it, is, it is quite disturbing, isn't it? I mean, if we saw this in, in certain other countries, governments saying we don't intend to keep our international treaties, we don't intend to respect human rights law, uh, we'd, we'd, be, we'd look at it very differently than we do when it's our own, don't we? <clears throat> this is a classic case of the government cherry picking the want of any relationship in Europe. And as Philippa was pointing about the European arrest warrants, like Theresa May, as a former Home Secretary, realised the importance of that. But the Human Rights Act that was brought in '98 by Tony Blair, but every law that's passed at Westminster and at the Scottish Holyrood has to comply with the Human Rights Act. And it's such fundamental issues such as torture, you know, the of torture of any form, 
And I think it's also particularly important that we are, as a, the United Kingdom, seeing as we do not have a, cons, a written constitution mm. in things like the Human Rights Act protects the fundamental rights of citizens. It's very important to hold on to that. And it's also another red herring that the Tories always go on about sovereignty and that the UK courts, when it comes down to it, are sovereign. You go to appeal, you shift, you, you can European courts. There's a fundamental issue, the Cadder Law in 2010-11, establishing people's right to color. So when you're arrested by the police, which people weren't aware of, that went to the European court. But people don't realize how fundamentally important is to our rights as citizens and the way that stories are to, to cast this aside. Also, when it comes to intelligence, you know, between today, the cooperation between European countries, especially terror, terror threats, etc., uh, you're, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also, it's another thing that Tories use when it comes to migration, and this was used very much uh, during the Brexit vote, and so many people did vote for Brexit. Uh, they were wanting to keep out migrants who had nothing to do with the EU. And fundamentally, this is another myth that the media doesn't clear up enough. Britain has control of Immigration, the major sources of immigration we have strict control over. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, to just to come back to you, uh, Philippa, this, uh, as, as we've said, this, this kind of, it's all been wrapped up in Brexit. Um, is, do you think, Brexit being used uh, almost as a smokescreen for things that the Tories wanted to do anyway? Or do you think this is more a case of uh, this is this is stuff that kind of flows from what the what they think Brexit has to mean? Uh, I think, to be honest, I think the Conservatives are quite Machiavellian. And, uh, you know, if you look at this Prime Minister and the whole issue of him having written, you know, an article supporting Remain and an article supporting Leave right at the beginning of the Brexit campaign, his main aim was to be Prime Minister. It's as simple as that. And the main aim of the party is to stay in power. So there's a kind of constant looking at, you know, focus groups and narratives and, you know, these three word slogans, what plays well with people. I mean, we had Pretty Patel talking about activist lawyers as if somehow they were breaking the rules in, in standing up for their clients. That's their job within the law. So, you know, we, we also had in the Withdrawal Agreement Act, uh, the plans and in the manifesto, the, the plan to rebalance power between the executive, as in the government and the parliament, and the law courts. So you, you literally have that with an unwritten constitution, or frankly, not much of a constitution, all the pillars that were kind of holding up the, the rights of citizens are being undermined. And asylum seekers are not economic migrants. The UK has a responsibility to people who are fleeing war or persecution. And frankly, those who are coming from, you know, Libya or the Middle East, we contributed to the instability that is driving mm. them here. So, so this idea that, oh, you know, the UK can wash their hands and say, we're having nothing to do with this. And, and the other thing is, Oh, it's sovereignty. I mean, that part of, I'm sure we'll come on to it anyway, this, you know, clauses in the UK um, internal market bill that talk about, well, we can break bits of international law when we want to, because we are sovereign in every treaty, in every international agreement, you are making a compromise to get a gain. They don't talk about the lack of democracy in the World Trade Organization. You know, so it's a very bizarre set of slogans and campaigns that are all being mishmashed together and are being put under the banner of Brexit. And a lot of the harm of Brexit, the economic harm of Brexit, is in turn going to be hid underneath the impact of COVID. So there, I think there are these fundamental things that the Conservative Party or the most extreme kind of factions within the Conservative Party have wanted to do for a long time. And now they feel it's kind of game on 
what we are seeing is if you like some of the more traditional conservatives including backbench mps are very uncomfortable with this idea of the uk becoming a pariah state or a rogue state that simply can't be trusted Mm. Well, I do want to come on to all that Brexit stuff, but uh, just to remind you, if you do want to join the conversation yourself here on Broadcasting Scotland, you can do so if you can follow us on Twitter at Broadcast Scott and then use the hashtag Full Scottish. Uh, we'll be bringing some of those tweets up on the screen there, as you can see now. Uh, but yeah, you mentioned Brexit there, Philippa, and obviously we're now in a... a, a, a rather a different situation than we were even a couple of weeks ago with this uh claim by the the British government that they are willing and uh, indeed intend to break international law. Um, now this internal market bill, it's been controversial for as long as we've known that it was coming. Um, but now that you've seen the, the text of it, are you more worried or, or is there anything in there that's kind of eased your concerns? <laughs> no, not at all. I think everyone who has now seen the bill recognises that it's more extreme than the white paper that came out uh, and particularly around the plans to undermine the state aid and uh, kind of border issues uh, of the Northern Ireland Protocol. I mean, the withdrawal agreement was something that Boris Johnson claimed to have come up with, claimed was a great success and claimed was an oven ready deal. Now in Parliament, because it was over 500 pages long, the act that, that brought it in, uh, you know, uh, the, the actual withdrawal agreement, the opposition parties all called for longer to scrutinise it, to study it and to debate it. And that was turned down. So it was basically about three days. So for him now to be coming back going, oh, yeah, no, I never really thought it was much good and I want to get rid of it. When that was what he campaigned on, in December is just, and, and what he then put through the parliament is is outrageous. And, and obviously we are in essence now staring down the barrel yet again of a no deal Brexit. Um, they have written to organizations like pharmaceutical companies to say, can you build your stockpiles up again? But the problem is we're in the middle of a global pandemic. You know, there are shortages of drugs, medical devices, supplies, as we know only too well in the, the kind of scrabble for PPE a number of months ago. So just building up stockpiles isn't easy. And I'm, I'm on the EU committee and we were hearing from road hauliers, customs agents, and basically things are not in place for the end of this year. And so they seem to be almost deliberately making it unavoidable that it will be a no deal. So while they keep saying, oh, a deal could be achieved, the combination of deliberately announcing in the House Commons they would break international law and undermine a treaty they just signed a number of months ago, and now that they will abandon the European Convention on Human Rights, it, I mean, it's literally they're just poking the EU with a very sharp stick, trying to goad them into no deal. Mm. And Simon, this this is something that uh, a lot of anti-Brexit people have suggested for, for some time now, the idea that the, the British government is seeking no deal and are just trying to do whatever they can to avoid the, the blame for it, if you like. Uh, does that seem like what's happening to you or do you think there's there's some other explanation for all this? Um, I, I, th <coughs> I think they're making it up as they go along. I think I think this is, is linked into, and I think that uh, Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings, Michael, this they have close links with the Trump administration, and they've watched what Trump has done and what Trump has been able to get away with. Remember, Michael Gove was one of the very first people to do an interview with President Trump. I don't know if you remember that when Murray uh, that up with, uh, in New York. But this idea that you have content for the law, you create narrative and you can, and the way that you play it in the media and you have strong support for this in the media and, you know, like the United States and more so even in Britain, the press is fundamentally pro-government, pro-Johnston and pro-right. And, you know, it's it's smacks of hypocrisy, but... It's very likely Human Rights Act, the idea you the, the internal market bill, 
Um, and it's very modern in that it links together with Trump and a contempt for the law. But it goes back more than 100 years. See, this is something that it is a myth that the Conservatives are constitution a constitutional party. Go back. In 1912, the Ulster Volunteer Force got formed. It was, a, it was a form of insurrection against the Liberal government, and the Tories backed this. This was a sort of armed militia was formed. You remember the Curra Mutiny in 1915? That was British army officers with Tories rebelling again against the Asquith government at the time. So these are sort of, it's almost linked historically, but I think it just goes to show that there is a sort of a ruling elite. There has always been a ruling elite. Uh, this one that we have at the moment is just a bit more vulgar and brash and possibly less old school, totally immoral, the sort of deals they will do with anybody. And like Philippa will have seen it in the comments, the new general, Suela uh, Braverman. I mean, there's a good article in the paper today. She's a very dodgy character with and basically she also lies about academic work she's done or contributed to okay, I mean, she's contributed to legal textbooks which she hasn't but that, the fact that it that is this is different in the past the tories probably would not have appointed somebody like that as attorney general there would have been too much of an uproar but today the the climate we live in this is accepted mm -hmm. And Philippa, on on that note, we do have this kind of we've had this this problem since uh, since uh, 2016, where there's just been this very stark division in society. There have been, uh, and it seems that as uh, as the Brexiteers have got more, the Brexiteers have got more and more extreme since the since the vote actually happened. Do you think this was something that was always in the works amongst the the sort of Brexiteer brain trust, or is this something where they've they've realised that some of the promises they made, some of the, the the things they wanted to have happen, were going to be a lot more difficult than they thought, and they've had to, as as Simon said, just make it up as they go along. Well, I think there's a whole mixture in there. There's definitely quite a lot of making it up as you go along if you look at the sheer number of U-turns across different policies. But I think there are, there are if you like, the foot soldiers of Brexit, um, and then there are the masterminds behind it. And if you follow some of the threads, you really get back to a kind of global disaster capitalism, which connects the UK and America. And there are people who have made millions out of COVID, they will make millions uh, through hedge funds, etc., out of a no-deal Brexit. Some of the most high profile in the UK are backers of Boris Johnson and helped fund his leadership campaign. So, you know, it, it's the kind of puppets and puppet masters. But certainly if you look at the campaign in 2016, it was, oh, of course, we'll stay in the single market. Um, you know, <coughs> it'll be the work of an afternoon. But in a way, you can never please them because, you know, they have, as you say, they have become more extreme. They have moved and moved until the only true form of Brexit is a no deal Brexit, regardless of the fact that they still talk about making, you know, trade agreements with other nations, being a member of the WTO, which also has rules, but has no democratic structure. So it, it's a very bizarre mix. But I think there are people who are, as I say, the foot soldiers who are being played by the puppet masters and when you follow them a lot of it comes back to money money and power as simon says the elites are still there and on this division not brexit or anti-brexit but wealthy versus non-wealthy has been building since the 80s mm. and of course philippa the there's also this question of a uh, the threat to devolution from the internal market bill um we've, we've heard people in wales <coughs> in Northern Ireland and, of course, here in Scotland, all giving very, very similar warnings. Um, again, is this something that you think the the British government was, was considering anyway? I mean, we know, for example, Michael Gove was never uh, a fan of devolution, was never, in fact, a fan of the Good Friday Agreement either. Is this maybe a chance for... Uh, some of those people to to settle old scores, they're they're using this this opportunity to to drive a coach and horses through the devolution settlement. 
uh, well, it's not just Michael Gove, the Tories in general, <clears throat> pardon me, campaigned against devolution all the way through, have never supported devolution. And there's two aspects to the bill. One is the one that's getting all the attention, obviously the undermining of the Northern Ireland Protocol, but the other one is taking a double bladed axe to devolution. And there's several parts of that. Obviously the fact that if England, uh, through the UK government accepts low quality food to get trade deals, Scotland and Wales, even though they had powers over um, maintaining standards, obviously all under an EU umbrella, will not be able to stop these goods being sold in Scotland and Wales. The other part of it, Clause 46, is also where the UK government is taking the right to offer what they call financial assistance, make them sound like Lady Bountiful, of being able to spend money in health, education, sport, culture, etc., in a direct way. So they are going to try to cut the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish government out of making decisions about how funding is spent in Scotland. I mean, an example I would use of how bad that will be is simply the the issue around the COVID testing. That is under the UK government. It's not under the community testing anyway. The non-NHS mm -hmm. Deloitte commercial stuff is under the control of Matt Hancock. And they set up home testing, which is meant to be delivered and picked up by Amazon. But Amazon don't deliver to big swathes of the highlands and islands. So it just shows you the ignorance in London and Westminster about the topography and geography of, of Scotland means they will come up with really ridiculous solutions which they would be able to force on local authorities or public bodies in Scotland or else it'll be unless you do it our way you're not having the funding and so this is literally unwinding devolution and taking power back into Westminster and people need to realize that you know, it may only be 55% of people support independence, but it's a much higher proportion recognize the gains they've had from devolution, you know, from the baby box to free tuition and prescriptions to free personal care. Those are things delivered by the Scottish Parliament. And if we don't go forward to the point where we are in control, then we will actually go back, pardon mm. me, we'll go backwards. And Simon, uh, as I said, we've seen this uh, kind of strong reaction from uh, from Cardiff, from Edinburgh, and from from Belfast. Uh, do you do you see any way that the devolved uh, governments can fight back against this uh, the the proposals in the Internal Market Bill, or is this going to be a, an example of how Westminster sovereignty really works? Um, I, I think that's the government's the attitude. They will just bulldoze their way, their way forward with this. The thing, you know, there's been a wee bit of a spike in support for, for individuals uh, in a poll last week after the announcement. So I think the more this thing sinks in, uh, the sort of basically the power grab that they're taking away from the Scottish Parliament. Um, the, uh, probably the greater the greater threat to the possibility of peace in Northern Ireland. I was struck last week a couple of friends of mine who are traditional Labour uh, voters and they have uh, voted, uh, they voted uh, no in 2014 and they weren't quite tipped over by Brexit, the Brexit, but one of them texted me immediately, the internal bill came through last Wednesday or Tuesday, whenever, and said that his tipping point that had tipped him over, and he felt that it would be this person isn't a fan of the SNP, but thought this would be another booster uh, to the SNP and the independence cause in general. And, and um, Adolf Johnston and Gold, they really care about that. I think their attitude, um, you can almost sidestep democracy and uh, conventional. British institutions like Parliament, like uh, Scottish and um, Westminster Parliament, and the public don't really like that, like these institutions. All they want is some sort of strong, charismatic, 
leadership. You could almost describe that as a form of fascism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that's quite an extreme to make ways. But you follow the process down the road. That is what that is what fascists do. They incrementally start taking away basics. And we've seen a double whammy with the Human Rights Act, the threat to the Human Rights Act, and the internal bill that they're going to shove through taking away from the Scottish Parliament. And um, and I, I think it is a it is another step towards the breakup of the dysfunctional state that is uh, the United Kingdom. Another point about this, if I guess just flip back to Brexit in 2016, mm -hmm. what happened, the first past the post system, the lack of a, a written constitution, very few modern states operate in that, in that same manner as our system, mm -hmm. with an unelected second chamber. That permits the elite that has seized power to just build those through whatever they want. As Philippa knows that there could have been, if, if the, in a proportional uh, voting system, the House of Commons could have stopped Brexit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, speaking of uh, tipping points that, that we've seen uh, recently, um, this week we saw the BBC announced that it's no longer going to carry the First Minister's daily briefings uh, on a regular basis, or at least not on uh, broadcast television. Uh, this has caused a lot of anger amongst a lot of people, but uh, some some happiness on, on other sides. Uh, we saw uh, Lord Folkes uh, claim credit for this, uh, that this was something that he and Jackie Bailey had made representations to the BBC about, and he was pleased that they had listened. Um, so. Philippa, let me come to you first on this. Um, what do you think of the, the decision itself uh, by the BBC? And, and also, what do you make of this, uh, this crowing by certain figures in the Labour Party? Um, well, just before we come on to that, if I can make a comment about what we were talking about oh, sure. before. If Boris Johnson uh, and the Conservatives cared about the union at all, they wouldn't be following this line their treatment is like an abusive relationship where, no, I'm not giving you a divorce and therefore what I'm going to do is take away your bank account and I'm going to lock you in your room. I've yet to see that kind of reaction within a marriage make it a happy relationship again. So, mm. you know, this isn't going to work out for them, this kind of bullying uh, of the, the people of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. With regarding the BBC decision, I think it's an appalling decision. Um, I mean, my mum is 85. She listens to the briefings every single day. Um, if this was over, that would be fine. But it isn't over on a world basis. This pandemic is only really getting going. And even we see here, I mean, in July, we had got down to single figures in some of the days. And now we're back, as you said, 221 cases in the last 24 hours. And that's us before we fully get into autumn with students going back to university with everyone having to move indoors and then into winter with influenza circulating at the same time this is a ridiculous time to take it away and to say that oh well people can access it online older people who are most vulnerable get their information from broadcast media from the television and the bbc is a public service broadcaster the First Minister has done her darndest to avoid party politics creeping into it. It is never in her statements. And she does her best to avoid the tiger traps that a lot of journalists were laying for her by asking incredibly pointed political questions. And she usually doesn't rise to that. There might be the odd time where she slipped, as she said herself, but it has certainly not been her intention and I would say 99.99% of the time, she has managed to keep her response in these briefings totally non-party political. So to me, the decision to shut them down in response to Lord Fouts and Jackie Bailey and to see Murdo Fraser crowing about it at such a precarious time in Scotland's epidemic is absolutely irresponsible. Mm. And Simon, obviously, uh, there's been a lot of uh, distrust of the BBC on the, the independence side of Scotland for, for several years. 
Uh, but this, uh, the, these briefings do seem to have been very popular with a, a huge swathe of the country, far more than just the the 50 whatever percent who are pro independence. Uh, what what effect do you think this will have on on how people perceive the BBC? Um, I well, I, I think it was also the Tim Davy, the new director general, and people look at him as being a party political or really a government appointment, the fact mm -hmm. that he was, uh, his Tory pass is formerly the deputy chair of the Hammersmith and Film Conservative Party. But his uh, visit to Scotland last week, and then this happening now, and Philip at this point, the BBC is a public service broadcaster, it has got to uh, take care of it. its audience, the licence, etc. And... Lord Fouts, George Fouts and Jackie Bailey would have been criticising Nick Durgeon away during this. She wasn't mm -hmm. available. And the media and politicians of opposite, opposite parties always demand that uh, the First Minister, Prime Minister, etc. is to account by the media. And Sturgeon has uh, presented herself regularly I think people like Myrtle Fraser, George and Jackie, it sticks in their craw a bit that Nicholas Sturgeon has handled the pandemic crisis very well, uh, cross-party supporters, admiration for the way she's dealt with it. And you saw Piers Morgan last week making the comment uh, how you're seeing how women leaders like Nicholas Sturgeon, Angela Merkel and Jacinda Hearn of New Zealand had all handled it so much better than people like Trump and Boris Johnson. And I, I think it was a bit, it was a stupid, silly, pathetic mistake. I don't know if you've seen the professor of public health at Edinburgh University, David Sridhar, who the, uh, the Scottish government has been consulting. People have been having party political at her. I mean, she's an American. I mean, I know somebody in Northern said she's taken aback by this party political sniping and vitriol that's been turned their way. And I think it's just an and go by Labour politicians. Mm. Yeah, the thing it's, is, uh, um, Kenny, sorry, is sorry. just they, you know, they're saying it has to be newsworthy. You know, newsworthy means it has to be something new. But as Professor Bold, who is a professor of public health in Edinburgh, says, public health messaging is about repetition. You know, mm. the First Minister is always reminding people of what they need to be doing and, you know, promoting that people would download the app. You need to do that repeatedly. And when she is having to make a change, particularly a change that is something uncomfortable for us as members of the public, the, her ability to explain the rationale behind it increases the chances of people actually following the rules and that's what you will lose with a 30 second clip on the news or if someone editorially kind of looks at the uh, at the the press conference and goes now nah, we're not covering there there's nothing new there the public need to understand this and frankly the the numbers watching even on bbc scotland you know it's been about forty thousand and about two hundred and eighty thousand on BBC One. So even if they want to limit the BBC One coverage, yeah. but allow it to continue on, on BBC Scotland, where frankly, they've nothing on at that time. Mm -hmm. Apparently what's scheduled is, you know, um, one of these kind of shopping cash in the attics or, or whatever, bargain hunt, something like, I mean, that's ridiculous in the middle of an epidemic. Yeah. Yeah, well, Bargain Hunt is uh, going to replace it on, on BBC One. There's nothing at all, as far as we're aware, uh, replacing it on the BBC Scotland channel. It's well, uh, yeah, it's a strange decision, which I'm sure we will continue to to question uh, as over the coming days and weeks. But we want to have a look now um, at Belarus. Uh, we, we have been looking at Belarus quite a bit over the last month, uh, since the 9th of August, when the, the elections took place. Uh, the dictator, Alexander Lukashenko, allegedly won 80% of the vote. Uh, very few serious observers believe that that's even close to accurate. Um, 
And numerous uh, members of the, the Opposition Coordination Council have now either been detained or have been uh, driven into exile, most notably, of course, the, the, the person who actually stood against Lukashenko, who's now in, uh, in exile in Lithuania. Um, but this week we saw uh, dozens, uh, report, reportedly at least 30 women detained uh, by the, the, the authorities there in Belarus. Uh, Philippa, if I could come to you first on this. Um, this this uh, resistance, this opposition in Belarus, it has been led in very large part by women, uh, mostly uh, people, or in, in several cases, by women whose, whose husbands had been activists who have then been jailed or barred from standing. Uh, what do you make of the, the, the successes that they've had in, in getting attention, getting these protests to, to keep going? in the face of this repression? Well, I think if you look at um, movements across the world, uh, whether it's peace movements or uh, movements for democracy, quite often you find that women play a significant part in it. And they, women tend to be part of networks in society as opposed to acting as high profile individuals. And it's often that kind of cooperation that, that can give them more, more traction. I think we also still have that sexism that we expect, uh, you know, revolutionaries or opposition politicians to be male. And therefore, there is more attention when suddenly it's a group of women and not a group of men. Mm. But I think what we are seeing, and, and unfortunately, this sort of move, greater right wing authoritarianism, uh, you know, happening everywhere. Uh, in, in different parts of the world, which is really concerning. And of course, the, the idea that this was a free and fair election, as you say, I don't think anyone believes that. The problem is when we have Trump in America talking about, you know, shutting down polling booths, uh, hampering postal votes, refusing to leave the White House if he is unelected, you know, it kind of takes away that moral authority that the West often thinks it has. And what we've seen, you know, whether it's the Saudi bombing of Yemen, whether it's actions of Israel against Palestine, whether it's actions in Turkey or, or here in Belarus, we kind of see warm words at Westminster. We don't really see great action. And the more that the UK government steps back from international law and human rights, the weaker their voice becomes because people will turn around and say, well, look at you you know, what happened in the Brexit uh, referendum, how were votes manipulated by Cambridge Analytica, etc. So, you know, there's very much that it's important that action and not words, and it's important that the UK would take the plank out of its own eye before actually, you know, crowing or criticising other people. And that's what happens if you abandon international uh, human rights, international law, and the international order is frankly, your voice becomes not worth the breath you use. Mm. Now, speaking of uh, people abusing uh, their rights and uh, taking power that they perhaps shouldn't, uh, we heard this week uh, Roger Stone, the, the President Donald Trump's former aide, uh, saying that they should declare martial law if Trump uh, loses the election, he should arrest the he should arrest the the Clintons. Uh, he should arrest Tim Cook from Apple. He should arrest Mark Zuckerberg, uh, and and anyone else he said who had been involved in illegal activity. Um, we've seen, as as Philip has said, there Trump has been talking for some time about the the risks of of postal voting, which is in fact very secure uh, in the U.S. as it is here. Um, Simon, what do you think of this um, this increasing kind of language from Trump that he's he's not intending to to respect the outcome of the election and that he may try somehow to stay in power even if and when he loses? Well, that sort of alludes to to the point I was making earlier when you just totally defy the law and start taking people's rights away incrementally. And you know, people listening might think using the term fascism, you know, that, that is, you know, basically what 
many fascists or dictators have said before elections in the past that they will not accept a democratic result. Roger Stone's quite an interesting character. He's, he's one of these people that uh, is fact being stranger than fiction, and it goes way back to the time of uh, Nixon and the Watergate area era, and he's one of the Nixon's dirty tricks, you know, a young Republican activist. But there's that thread of the extreme right in American politics, and they've, this is their high tide, so to speak, at the moment with Donald Trump in the, the White House. They pardoned uh, Stone, who was actually, you know, found, found guilty of breaking the law uh, a few few months ago. So he got a presidential pardon. But it's, it is um, quite, it's quite shocking how rapidly this has happened. If you had said four years ago, when Trump was up for re-election, uh, not accept the result and uh, establishing martial law. If that had been part of the lead up to the 2016 election, what would people have said? What direction is America uh, going? And this is the sort of the coup, a coup against America, so to speak. That is what they're insinuating, what they're threatening. And I think they want to hype up the idea of this cult culture wars and a culture divide. And I think that that is the thing the thing is the best way of holding on to the Trump support is to polarize society. People won't judge Trump on the economy, they won't judge him on the handling of COVID. Mm. Ultra partisan and an ultra polarized election. Yeah. Philippa, um how how seriously should we take these threats? I mean, Trump is known to be full of a lot of bluster. But uh, when we hear this kind of stuff coming out over and over again, both from his own office and from his, his allies, uh, how, how seriously concerned should we be? I think we have to be very concerned. I mean, America is uh, still at the moment pretty much the most powerful country in the world. I mean, obviously, China is gradually giving it a, a run for its money, which is part of what upsets Trump. But the power they have is, is utterly enormous. And we've seen the damage over the last four years, you know, undermining NATO, uh, withdrawing from the climate change agreements, the Paris Agreement, uh, withdrawing funding for UNRWA, who provide relief to the Palestinians in the occupied territories. You know, he is very isolationist. He doesn't care also about international law or the international world order. And so I'm very concerned about how that destabilizes different parts of the world, including the Middle East. But also I'm concerned at the way that some of the key figures, including Boris Johnson, seem to be modeling themselves on his approach, perhaps not as extreme, but actually looking at what he gets away with and then thinking how much of that could we get away with here? So I think we should be very concerned. And another four years where Trump knows that he doesn't have to face re-election so he can do what he likes or where he tries to change that because he's already, you know, he hinted that in one of his smaller uh, kind of internal rallies where he was talking about 12 more years. So, you know, I think, I think we should be very concerned. Mm. Well, from one of the most powerful men in the world to someone with rather less uh, authority, um, the Labour Party in Scotland this week uh, has been trying to get rid of its leader, or at least some members have been trying to get rid of their leader, Richard Leonard. Um, he did, in fact, survive at the SEC the other day, and no confidence vote had been discussed, but uh, ended up not being held. Uh, Simon, you probably have more uh, insight into the internal workings of the Labour Party than most. Um, what do you think is, is behind this drive to get rid of Richard Leonard and is it going to work? Uh, no, it's not, not going to work. As we saw uh, yesterday, the, the motion was withdrawn from the Scottish Executive Committee meeting. Uh, it was a sort of right pathetic coup Remember the coup against Corbyn, which led to the second uh, leadership election, which he again won. Mm -hmm. That was formidable because, uh, you know, the strength of the PLP, the party machine. The fact that this was a bit of a damp squib 
is a reflection of the current state of Scottish Labour. It is also interesting to note that five years ago this would have succeeded, but the party has actually moved both in Scotland and throughout the UK. So the centrists, the Blairites, New, New Labour, uh, detritus, they do not hold the power that they stood in the party, so it backfired. But again, some of the individuals involved said, "Oh, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a centrist. I'm soft left, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But you know, like Daniel Johnson, Jackie Bailey, J Jenny Mara, etc. Et but you know, their careers are on the line because late polling is, you know, it's down fourteen percent. I think the last one I saw, they've got got back up to eighteen percent. But it is not Richard Leonard's fault. He's not a charismatic leader. I don't see anybody who would really do that much better a job for the most problems in Scotland are so fundamental. I think they're, they're, they're sort of irretrievable, the fact that, that Labour can get back to being a serious force again in a union in the UK. Labour may have a life if Scotland became an independent uh, country. The Scottish Labour Party could be revived. But I do agree with uh, Richard Leonard. You know, he hasn't cut through to the public. But I disagree on his sense towards the idea of a referendum. And I think that is another huge mistake Labour is making is to be opposed to the idea of Scotland once again referendum. And if in next May, if the SNP have an overall majority. I do have any Democrat can argue against them because everyone knows when they go to the poll what the SNP stand for, what they, what is in the SNP's manifesto. And if people oppose that, you're opposing the democratic will of the people. Mm -hmm. And Simon, we've heard, uh, we've heard uh, analysis done that says that up to a third of uh, the, the Labour voters who are still with the party are actually pro-independence. Um, what yeah. do you think is behind the the Labour Party's just fixation on opposing democracy in Scotland? Why why do you think they're so determined to oppose a referendum? I think they've got into a sort of uh, intellectual cul de sac that they cannot stick their head up and have a clear vision. Future so obsessed with this internecine warfare they've had with the SNP. And having seen the SNP come from, you know, not too significant a party to eating up the centre-left Grey Gotland mm -hmm. has basically made, the, made them lose their marble, so to speak, how, how, you, how you deal with this. And uh, I mean, there were various mistakes. Labour, Labour over a decade ago, steps towards federalism. They, they throw that word out at the moment. There's been no serious work done on it, even just now. In ten years, I did some work for the party in that area. No one no one wanted to know. No one was interested. So their the lack of vision, uh, the only si slight uh, spasm of life returning to Labour came in 2017 when it got a small bounce, and it was a Corbyn factor. It was mm -hmm. nothing to do with Scottish Labour whatsoever. But as long as the SNP and the nationalism that they represent is a progressive, and Labour has to acknowledge that it's very different from forms of nationalism you see in Europe, their attitude mm -hmm. to immigration, asylum seekers, an opening, welcoming culture, the SNP deserve credit for that. And I, I've always credited the SNP leadership establishing these fundamentals of what the party is about and what their Scottish nationalism represents. Mm -hmm. And Philippa, obviously you've been uh, in Westminster since 2015, um, so for most of that time you've not seen a lot of Scottish Labour. Um, do you think that there's any chance of a, a, a change in leadership or a change in anything making any difference for Labour in Scotland at this stage? Well, I mean, I agree with Simon that Richard Leonard is not an inherently charismatic leader, but I don't think you can lay the fault at, at the door of that. They simply, the issue is they are supposedly a democratic party, 
they support carbon supported self-determination for every nation on the planet except scotland because that's what the snp are about you know the the term nationalism and nationalist is used to put us in a box we are accused of being nazis etc when as simon says you know our policies are completely the reverse of that we have no issue with other parties believing in the united kingdom and campaigning for it but to say in a in a uk where the landscape since 2014 has changed utterly that the people of scotland have no right to make any choice is utterly anti-democratic and if you think back to the promises one of the biggest promise was you know vote no to stay in the eu well that went out the window you are an equal in a family of nations well that's just a laugh so you know the way we are being treated the the winding back of devolution i agree with simon what he said earlier i think this will actually drive more people to support independence so labor could decide and they're not really scottish labor i mean they're there there is no scottish labor party or scottish conservatives or even scottish liberal that are registered with the electoral commission it is mm. very much from london and what would happen after independence is these parties would have to decide are we going to have a proper Scottish Labour Party, whatever they call it? And because Scotland does tend to lean towards centre left, then they would have, of course, a future in an independent Scotland. It's them that are boxing themselves in. And when we see the whole string of leaders they've had over the last decade, changing leader isn't going to change that. They need to actually believe that the people of Scotland have the right to choose their future and they should not be tied in to this isolationist kind of law-breaking britain which is led by an absolute charlatan mm. well on that note uh, we have been talking quite a bit today about uh tipping points people turning uh changing their minds about independence and uh notably ewan mcgregor uh, one of scotland's most successful actors one of our great cultural exports uh, said this week that he has now changed his mind. He had spoken in 2014, uh, I think quite reluctantly, uh, but certainly he had spoken then in favour of the union. Uh, but he says that things have changed now. Um, so, Simon, just quite quickly, uh, what do you make of these the these people, more and more people now coming out saying that something about usually the Brexit process has changed their mind? Uh, well, I think it, it, it did have a big impact because it's so fundamentally undemocratic because people can't accept people look all of now in a political culture as a from a or from a Welsh point of view, and I think the UK ha has become a dysfunctional state. It doesn't have a proper constitution. The idea that you can have a referendum where all 30 locals in Scotland voted to remain just immediately polarised, uh, uh, you know, excited the divisions between and England. And the fact that the UK never foresaw this, and we did have, like, in, in Australia, this is an example I've gone on a lot, in Australia, to have a referendum, all states must vote it. Mm -hmm. And that is why you have a, well, they're not a federal republic. They, they still have the monarchy. But in Germany, for instance, if they use referendums, each uh, state would have to vote for that. Mm -hmm. And the UK, I, I just, as I said, it's just another example. It highlights that. And it's people see it as fundamentally going across like the will of uh, what Scottish people want. And you and the events accentuating these divisions, and we've seen it again, what happened in Westminster last week mm. with the Internal Market Bill, with Johnson's approach to the Human Rights Act, with the government's different approaches to COVID, etc. These all just accentuate, and I think, and we see poll after poll now in the last six months shows that there is a majority of Scots favour independence. Yeah. 
And so, Philippa, just before we wrap up the show, um, how big a difference do you think it makes to have celebrities, including celebrities who don't maybe live in Scotland anymore, uh, making pronouncements about independence? Do you think it changes any <coughs> minds? Um, well, obviously, when it is people who spoke maybe quite forcefully for the union in 2014, there may be some among their fans who, who at least... Uh, think about it, look at it. I don't think it's necessarily something that changes people's minds. And obviously, either if they live here, they have one vote. And if they don't live here, they don't have any vote at all. But it can be an influencer. And certainly, the number of celebrities who, who spoke out, you know, we love you, don't leave us, etc. back in 2014. But it becomes a lot harder to repeat that when you see how abusively Scotland has been treated. Scotland and Northern Ireland both voted to remain. The Scottish government was the first to put pen to paper to put forward a compromise called Scotland's Place in Europe, which would be allowing Scotland and Northern Ireland to stay in the single market while inside the UK. Westminster threw that out in a matter of about six weeks and any suggestion from the Scottish government has been dismissed since. And now we see with the, the UK internal market bill, again, Scotland and Northern Ireland, how they're being treated. And, and even Wales, which voted to leave. Mark Drakeford saying, you know, that Scotland should not be denied a referendum. Wales and Scotland campaigning against this bill. They're just heaping up the reasons that are actually driving more people in Scotland to recognise if your future isn't in your own hands, it's in someone else's and you have no idea what they're going to do with it. Mm. Well, I'm sure we will keep talking about all of these issues, but uh, we are just about out of time just now. So I'd like to thank very much uh, Dr. Philippa Whitford and Simon Pia for joining us. And thank you at home for joining us as well. Uh, the whole point of these shows is to have an audience for them. So thank you very much for joining us. We would ask that if you're able to support us financially here at Broadcasting Scotland, you do go to broadcastingscotland.scot slash register and sign up there as a supporter. Uh, we've talked a lot about the, the BBC um, and this is, we're not in a position to challenge them yet, but uh, with a bit more support, uh, we, we want to get there. That is the ultimate goal. So please, uh, if you can support us financially, do what, do what you can to help us that way. If you can't, we do understand. We know uh, incomes are tight for an awful lot of people just now. Uh, but you can still make a big, big difference to us. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, at Broadcast Scott. You can find us on Facebook. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, like videos there, click the bell icon so that you get notified when we uh, upload a new video. Uh, and then share the shows around uh, with your friends and your family let people know why you support broadcasting scotland uh, and you can your word of mouth can be the best way for us to to get the word out about what we do here and finally uh, if you'd like to get involved here at broadcasting scotland there are lots of opportunities and lots of uh, lots of work that needs to be done here if we are going to keep growing and keep building a better broadcaster for scotland so if you've got any interest in broadcasting do please get in touch with us we would love to have you but that is absolutely all we have time for today. So once again, thank you very much to Dr. Philippa Whitford and to Simon Pia. Uh, Gordon will be back again tomorrow at 7 with another Scotland at 7. I'll be back in my regular slot on Tuesday evening. But until then, thanks again for joining us and have a great day. Goodbye.